Hello, I'm Adam Sullen, and this is Page by Page, a show dedicated to promoting literacy, authors, their works, and their words. And today, my guest is Gordon Belt. Gordon is the author of John Severe, Tennessee's first hero, released by the History Press. Thanks for coming, Gordon. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Yeah, anytime. So tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started with your book. Sure. Um, well, I am the Director of Public Services for the Tennessee State Library and Archives, and I've actually been in the field of public history for nearly about 20 years. Um, prior to that, I worked at the First Amendment Center at Vanderbilt University. And I've always had a passionate interest in history, especially Tennessee history. And so um, this book is a culmination of that, that interest. And uh, I found John Sevier to be a compelling figure that really didn't get a lot of uh, attention in recent years. And so I wanted to delve into that. And so I have an interest in the early republic and uh, Sevier sort of fit very nicely into that, that niche interest of mine. Good. Uh, so you worked uh, for the Freedom, the First Amendment First Center. Amendment Center. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, John Siegenthaler was one of your bosses. Oh there? yes, yeah. he's a, a a boss, a mentor, a friend, uh, uh, really wonderful person, uh, a hero to a lot of Nashvilleians and a lot of Middle Tennesseans, right. and uh, is a real supporter of of uh, my research and and the work I did at the center, and continues uh, to this day. We maintain a good friendship. Good. Okay. Uh, we kind of modeled our show a little bit mm -hmm. after his, a word on words, so uh, kind of a shout out to John Siegenthaler. He's kind of an inspiration to us here too, uh, so we have that in common. Mm -hmm. uh, John Severe, your book was great. Thank uh, you. Really enjoyed it. I learned a whole lot by reading it. How hard was it to write this book since so much of the information about Severe was kind of romanticized and mm -hmm. novelized over the, year, uh, over the years? How could you tell fact from fiction? Well, in a lot of ways, you can't. Um, Severe is a figure that's sort of wrapped up in this, this whole legend and lore that was created during the mid-19th and early 20th century. And uh, the closest thing we really have to learning about who this man was are the manuscripts that uh, Lyman Draper compiled while he was researching these borderlands and during the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, we have Severe's letters, of course, from his time as governor. And, uh, but beyond that, a lot of what we know about Severe today is wrapped up in these narratives that were written uh, at the time period, the, early, or the late 19th, early 20th century. And, uh, you know, folks like uh, John Haywood, uh, J.G.M. Ramsey, Theodore Roosevelt wrote a book, The Winning of the West, that was uh, very influential in, in really um, shaping Sevier's legend as the Tennessee's first hero. And the, the subtitle of my book, Tennessee's First Hero, was inspired by a line in Carl Driver's book, which incidentally was the last full-fledged biography of Sevier that was published in the early 30s, reissued in the 70s, and really nothing of a biographical nature has been written since. And so uh, writing about this man is, is a challenge. And so what I wanted to do is focus my book on the historiography and look at his life through this lens of history and memory. Uh, it's not a true biography in, a, in that sense, but it is a blending of history and biography using Sevier's life as a template to talk about how writers and historians really uh, looked at Sevier as a source for inspiration. And uh, you broke the book into three different sections. There was mm -hmm. the pioneer, and then uh, the soldier, mm -hmm. and then the statesman section. Mm -hmm. Those words are on his monument in Exactly, exactly. Uh, which section did you enjoy writing the most? Oh, um, you know, I actually started looking at Sevier's life towards the end of his life. And so the statesman is what I first started looking at in terms of um, uh, you know, a research project. I, I didn't really conceive of the book until as I started writing for my blog, The Posterity Project, uh, writing about Severe. I was looking at his later years, and as I went along, I started reading about the Indian Wars, and obviously uh, he's a hero of the Battle of Kings Mountain. So looking at that end of his life, his life as a soldier in the middle of his life, that's something that was intriguing. His early years, the years as a pioneer, 
you know, we really don't know a lot about those years other than the legends and folk tales and the narratives that were passed down through generations, these oral histories that were passed down from families and so on. And so um, that was the most challenging part because you're looking at his life through their eyes. And as you go into his life later, you see more of his work and his writings reflected in the book. And so um, I was really fascinated with uh, actually his death and how people remembered him uh, immediately following his death and then years afterward. He died in 1815. And uh, honestly, I was puzzled by why he was not really revered in, in this ex such an extent as you would think because there was no monument to his name. He was buried in a, uh, a, sh a grave in, in Alabama shortly after he died surveying Creek Territory. And uh, it was about seven decades later that people suddenly realized that this man, this first governor of our state, this Tennessee hero, was in Alabama and there was no place to really remember him. And so in the 1880s, you start seeing in the aftermath of the Civil War, this uh, notion that we had to reunite and find figures, Southern figures, that could be symbolize that unification, and Sevier was, was that man. And so, uh, you know, as he was being brought back to Knoxville and a monument was being built to his name, uh, that whole episode I write in the book, and it was really fascinating to me. That was very interesting to me as well. I had no clue he was there in Alabama for all of those years, mm -hmm. but just a stump as a headstone. Mm -hmm. and, uh, another part that I found very fascinating was the soldier section. And uh, uh, what was it you wrote that there were 35 battles and 35 mm -hmm. victories. Mm -hmm. But you said that the Battle of Kings Mountain was his finest hour. Mm -hmm. It was literally his finest hour because that battle was won within about an hour's span by uh, Severe and, and several of his compatriots, Isaac Shelby and others, who um, basically gathered up their overmountain men, these out, you know, basically these backwoodsmen of the frontier against uh, Major Patrick Ferguson, the British uh, general. And uh, his forces were made up of loyalists. There were really no British soldiers fighting other than, than Patrick Ferguson. And so it was almost uh, American versus Tory in, in this, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, but uh, this is a battle that really made severe. This is a battle that uh, created for him um, the platform from which he could launch his political career and ambitions. And so uh, he used that battle in his rhetoric when he's uh, later on trying to advocate for the state of Franklin. He reminds his citizens about how he suffered and sacrificed for the Patriot cause and how the state of Franklin uh, should be recognized because of that sacrifice. And so that battle really made him uh, an important influential figure, not only in his time, but long after, because that's what people most remember him for, other than being governor of Tennessee. Well, you uh, touched on uh, the state of Franklin a mm -hmm. little bit, and that's uh, something that we learn a little bit about in Tennessee history class, but not a whole lot. Uh, he wrote that he was kind of reluctant to become the governor mm -hmm. because really he was going to lose a lot of his appointments mm -hmm. if he became the governor of this uh, lost state. Mm -hmm. um, but once he became governor, he became governor full heartedly. Oh, yes. Uh, can you describe what he was doing to make sure this state was uh, seen as a state? Uh, well, uh, of course, the Franklinites they named the state of Franklin after Benjamin Franklin with the hopes that Benjamin Franklin would actually endorse statehood. Um, Franklin was sort of lukewarm. He really, um, he appreciated the recognition, but he, he really advised Severe and the Franklinites to uh, mend their fences with North Carolina. North Carolina had ceded its western lands to Congress uh, to pay off the war debt for the American Revolution. But then they decided they had a change of heart and wanted the land back. And so in this contest between North Carolina and the Franklinites, 
have this rivalry going on between John uh, Severe and John Tipton. And Tipton was uh, wholeheartedly against uh, the state of Franklin, although he, he was part of the uh, Franklin Convention. He aligned himself with North Carolina. And John Sevier uh, was convinced uh, by his friend William Cock to become part of the Franklinites, and they ultimately elected him governor. And so uh, one of the things that Sevier did uh, through this tumultuous time was uh, he engaged in a lot of uh, Indian battles in hopes that uh, victories there would uh, inspire people to come follow him. Uh, he was gone for periods of time fighting Cherokees and then coming back. And, and, uh, and so state of Franklin for four years, it was sort of a dual government going on. You had North Carolina and, South, or North Carolina and state of Franklin uh, basically uh, setting up uh, court systems. And so if you, you wanted to uh, apply for a land grant or if you wanted to get married or anything, you had to go to two different court systems. It was really uh, not the most ideal situation. So, um, you know, that, that whole episode is just a, a fascinating uh, time in our state history. And it's been uh, looked at by future historians as uh, there are two distinct phases of Franklin. Uh, early on you see people embracing Franklin as sort of this uh, stepping out and planting democracy on the frontier. And then later in the 1930s you see a move uh, really influenced by the Great Depression where people are looking at this and saying these guys were actually interested in acquiring land and they had no uh, altruistic motives for creating the state. But ultimately the patriotic narrative won out. And so um, what you see even today is this reverence for the state of Franklin and John Sevier's role in it. Yeah. Uh, of course, the aftermath of the state of Franklin, you see John Sevier arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, North Carolina charges him with treason. Mm -hmm. Then just two years later, he's uh, a representative in uh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So uh, that really wouldn't happen today. If someone charged you with treason, no. I think your political <laughs> career would pretty much be over. No, uh, no. But the times were different, and you touched on this a little bit. You, we think of, you know, look back fondly on our founding fathers and think, oh, they must have gotten along so well. Mm -hmm. Well, John Tipton, John Sevier, that was no love lost there for yeah. sure. And then Andrew Jackson and John Sevier. Mm -hmm. uh, again. <laughs> That's a rivalry that, uh, that deserves its own book, frankly. Right. Um, I enjoyed writing that chapter of the book because um, what you see in, in, in that instance is a young upstart attorney, Andrew Jackson, trying to make a name for himself in Tennessee, and John Sevier, the established governor of the state, and someone who uh, wants to hold on to that power. He's a very popular figure, um, and so Jackson challenging him um, was quite audacious um, and Severe, I think, uh, really uh, looked at Jackson with disdain uh, early on. They had some letters where they exchanged pleasantries and they, and I write about that in the book, but um, when they were running uh, for public office, uh, Jackson charged Severe with land fraud publicly. And obviously, Severe was not happy about that. And so when they confronted each other in the courthouse steps at Knoxville, uh, there was this altercation that uh, really spawned a, almost a humorous exchange of letters. Um, Jackson um, was really trying to express to Severe that he had great services that he provided to the state. And Severe's reaction to that was, services. I know of no great service you've delivered to our, our state except to go to Natchez with another man's wife. And so he insulted Rachel Jackson. That's one thing you did not do. Exactly. If you know anything about the relationship between Rachel and Andrew Jackson is you do not insult Rachel. You incur the wrath of Old Hickory. And so from that point forward, uh, Jackson and, and Sevier were bitter enemies. And so the two had to be separated. There was, there was a there was a scuffle and 
Uh, one bystander got shot by a, a, an errant bullet that was fired by one of the friends of the, the people surrounding the two men. And, and they eventually separated, but after that there was this exchange of letters and, and they called each other cowards and poltroons and uh, Severe and, and Jackson were trying to uh, arrange a place to meet for a duel because Jackson had challenged Severe to this duel. He wanted to duel him in Knoxville and, and of course Severe, he didn't want to duel in Knoxville because it's against the law to duel in the state of Tennessee. So he said, I'll duel you out in, in the uh, Native American lands. And, and they went back and forth, you know, calling each other cowards and so forth. But when they finally met uh, on the Kingston Road, uh, it, was a, it was almost a comedy of errors. It wasn't a, really a duel at all. You had um, two opposing views written about the incident in the press. Jackson's allies claimed that Severe hid behind a tree and uh, Severe's allies uh, really evoked his past accomplishments as proof that he was uh, uh, this patriot and hero and how dare Jackson call him a coward. He stood up to Jackson. And so that whole episode, they never did really duel each other. And I think if they had, it would have obviously altered the course of history. If Jackson had killed Severe, obviously, Severe's popularity, um, that would have made Jackson's political career basically dead in the water. And obviously, if uh, Severe had killed Jackson, you wouldn't have the age of Jackson and, and history would, would forever be changed. I don't know if you're a betting man or not, but who would you have put your money on? <laughs> well, I would not bet against Andrew Jackson. Yeah. I mean, he, he was an expert at, at uh, confrontation and dueling. And so, and Severe, of course, was an older man at the time. Um, you know, you hate to put yourself in that, you know, what if something happened? And, and, but, you know, think about it. Uh, you know, I would not want to be in severe shoes if Jackson was uh, uh, breathing hot down my neck. That would not be good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, do you have any plans for something down the road? Well, yes. Um, you know, my wife and I wrote this book together. I'm the primary author of this book. She wrote a book, our first book, called Onward Southern Soldiers. And that looked at the role of religion in the Army of Tennessee during the Civil War. And so we've collaborated on two books. Um, we're looking at possibly doing a third one on a variety of topics. One topic that came up uh, that we looked at was uh, the Indian Wars and sort of a, 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 a follow-up to this book, uh, looking not only at Severe's Indian Wars, but the Indian Wars in general uh, during the same time period. And, uh, during the research for this book, I encountered a lot of the letters, um, a lot of the recollections of, of the descendants and also the aging uh, veterans of those wars. And you read those letters and there's just really compelling storytelling in those accounts. And so we've looked at a compilation, something like that. I've also looked at possibly doing a, a, a brief biography of, of uh, Joseph Martin, who was uh, a fellow that uh, Severe had uh, a rivalry with during that State of Franklin period and was an Indian agent during the time period. So, um, you know, I, I enjoy this time period in history and I enjoy writing this book, these books. Uh, having a spouse who really enjoys it too is a, a, a real blessing for us and so we're, uh, we're looking forward to the next chapter. Good, good. Uh, if people want to find out more about you, or I know you do your posterity project, mm -hmm. uh, tell them how to find information on that. Sure, uh, you can go to uh, you can go to Google and type posterity project, and uh, that'll be the first thing you see. Uh, and uh, on the blog, I, I write about uh, severe, and I write about uh, the Indian Wars and, and this time period. But I also write about archives and public history. It, it, began, it was a blog that began in 2008 as sort of a, a, a way to share my interest in, the, in, in this time period in Tennessee history and also in archives and history. And uh, there's a lot of content on there and they can learn more about that and, and learn more about our books too. Good. Well, Gordon, thank you for what you do and thanks for being with me today. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. Hope you'll visit your local library and keep reading.